So you said you found out that 64% of the women in your shelter? 62 of the women 62. out of the 100 were as violent, yeah. How did you find that? Well, we did three generational questionnaires together. And what kind of abuse were they? Uh, mostly from the, the ones that actually were violent themselves, you could see, were mostly from violent prone families. Because it is generational, that's what I was trying to say. Look, have a look at this. Because the idea was that the feminist ideology and, and also what they talked about was all these innocent, you know, hapless women coming in with children with these brutal, violent men behind them. No, it's not like that. Any more than it is for men. I mean, there are men who are extraordinarily violent, coming from violent backgrounds. But there's plenty of men who, by accident, get involved with violent women and that end up suffering exactly the same way. So were you finding more women that were violent towards their male partner or towards their children? The figures for women being violent towards their children is much higher. And you can't just simply say, oh, well, it's because women are actually left alone with children far more than men. That's true. But the fact is, neither a, a man, and the majority of the very serious violence, the people do have personality disorders, one sort or another. You can't leave them alone with very vulnerable small children. They can't cope. It's cruel. And we, fortunately, because of the, of the programs we ran, if I had a mother coming in who was dangerous to her children, I would then be able to put her in one of our houses where the older mothers would mother her and take care of her and her children. That's what was needed, not keep taking the children away where they keep getting replaced, because you're only doubling and trebling the problem. But nobody would listen. So you're processing everything. Yeah. Um, I think there's a tendency in this debate between women's issues and men's issues to take whatever statistic is against a certain gender and yeah. if you are that gender, you feel attacked. If you're the opposite gender, you're saying, see? Um, That's what I keep saying to, all, to both sides, is can we stop the, what you did to me and what I did to you? Because that's not what it's about. It never has been about, actually. It's actually what happened to you, how you grew up, what happened to you, what you're doing now, how you're trying to make relationships or failing to make relationships, whether you're a man or a woman. That isn't the issue. And we're wasting so much time on this war. Any time you talk to impassioned men who have been burnt horribly by what's happened to them, you can say the same to a woman who's been horribly burnt what's happened to her. That isn't the answer. The time has come. And actually, I'm very glad. We have a thing called WOW, which is Women of the World, every year. It's always done on Women's Day, International Women's Day, March the 8th. And it was so wonderful for me because sitting there talking to, and the room was absolutely packed. It was about as big as this with women all against the walls and men. And I remember saying at the end, thinking, oh God, how's this going to go? I just said, if men and women won't come together to work on this subject of domestic violence, then there really is no future. And all the women in the room, as only one woman, but everybody else said, we agree. And they were all feminists. So I think, the hope I have, is that there is a new, much younger feminist, not carrying the burdens of the very early feminists, who now have a great deal of freedom to make the decisions they want to make. And I'm hoping that they will bring that to the table and work with men. Because I've always said there is a great need and there will always be a need for women's movement. Because the fact is that women, when they're having children in their lives, are vulnerable. And there's, we have to meet men's needs and what women need. And we will need to always make sure that the balance is equal. And for me, it wasn't that I ever, I left a movement that I passionately believed in. And it was a vision that I had. And I just feel it's been terribly betrayed. In some ways, it, you know, I've been interviewing MRAs since July and still have a long road to go. But, um, but it, it seems like every person I interview in the men's rights movement has a different take on the issues. Warren Farrell seems very balanced in his views on women's issues and men's issues and wants to see a gender transition where we're letting men stay home and we're encouraging women to be a part of the workforce and run for president. And, and uh, 
Then you have some other men like Harry Crouch who seems a little, he's angry and he'll admit it and it comes off. Um, you know, at times I, I felt like I was being attacked just for being a woman in the room as he talked about issues that men were coming in with and talking but about. But you see, one of the things I think was very difficult with the men is so many times you're talking to the walking wounded because they haven't healed themselves. And you have that also, you know, when women are, have come from extremely burning backgrounds. And until they actually have dealt with what's happened to them and been able to make some peace within themselves, they do more harm than good. Because they're talking, is this women's thing, they always said, the personal is political. Well, actually, no, it isn't. In fact, my father and mother were dysfunctional doesn't make all men and women dysfunctional. And I feel that's my message to the men as well. The fact, at the end of the day, it was your choice. It was my choice, the marriages I made, they didn't work out. Whatever the reason is, I'm responsible for my choice, and the same for men. So mm -hmm. I would want, and I tend to work with men who to a certain extent have reached a position where like Warren, they can be, be able to mediate their personal needs and the needs to make a movement that is going to bring harmony, hopefully, eventually to all of us. But, yeah, I just had a epiphany um, mm. with you saying that, that, you know, the feminists that are men hating are really hurting. Yeah. And vice versa. Absolutely. The walking wounded. And some of them were wounded from, from before they were born. And so if we would only begin to take time to understand what actually happens to a child when they're exposed to this sort of thing. I think the one thing that, when Kathy was standing in front of me, it wasn't the bruises that made me aware. There was that moment when she said, and no one will help me. And I remember being 17 with my sister and my brother was 14, my mother had died of cancer. My father brought the body home and put it in the dining room on the table. And for six days, he wouldn't bury her. So she rotted. And every night, he'd ask us to come in and he'd pull the cover off her. Because there was an open coffin and we'd see her. And I asked everybody, the, the doctor, our family doctor, Miss Williams who brought us up in the holiday house to come and help us. They came, but none of them helped us. And that was why the refuge movement was born because Kathy said, and no one will help me. And she was right, no one would. The doctor gave her tranquilizers to cope with the beating. The psychiatrist gave her even more pills, so she was addicted to pills. Everybody around her let it go on. And my life's work is that we do have to listen, we do have to hear, and we do have to recognize that it's too late often by the time you're talking to somebody who's in their 40s, 50s, 60s. It's this next generation of children who are now being born that we should be working with. So do you think this is just, is this a women's issues, she was battered and no one was helping her, or is it men's issues that they're being ignored and they're being called whiners and suck it up, or is it just a humanity lacking compassion? It's a human issue. And there are no votes. Uh, one of the greatest fears for any man standing up in your Senate is that he will lose women's votes. And who does the voting? Women. Particularly politically uh, active women. And the same in England. Yeah. And the, the, the idea that anybody, we have no, no minister, no members of parliament who stand up for men's rights in our country. I don't think you have any here, have you? No. Well, that says it all, doesn't it? Men run Congress, men, we have a male president, and you know, the highest- But then the thing you also president. have to say is men have no history of helping each other in emotional issues. And they don't, there's actually no history. Well, aren't there feminists trying to feminize men to be more emotional and share their feelings? No, most feminists don't want men in their lives. Mm. Actually, that's, that's the trouble. The, 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 this war that's been declared is actually been declared on men. And instead of 
putting out a hand and saying, hey, let's look at this together. It has been such a brutal war and men have lost so much because of it uh, that at the moment, as far as I can see, this is going to go on uh, until such time as I don't see what's going to actually, if nothing's done, the whole fabric of our social conditions in, in countries like ours are just falling apart. So we need to listen to men's issues. We need to listen to human issues, which is the family. The idea that the family should be destroyed, and it has been very destroyed, means that you actually take away the most valuable two human beings who love each other, commit themselves to each other, and choose to have children or not have children. That's what we should be celebrating. And we don't. We tell men that they should remove themselves, that women will have the children, women will look after the children, and that men are irrelevant. We pu we're punitive towards them in schools. Schools on the whole boys are failing, we know that. Men are failing on campuses. And nothing's being done about it. There are male feminists that are trying to bring equality to men. Does that work? I don't see why it shouldn't. I don't see why all men can't be feminists because they and, and agree. But one of the problems with the male fem feminists, this whole attitude towards men is somehow men have to be punished until they're good. There's something by being male. Well, have they said in the? If you look at the pickets, the when they used to picket me, it all used to say, "All men are bastards. All men are rapists." That is, behind all the anger, that is what's being said about men. And it's not true. I can't believe anyone who would believe that, though. Mm. I mean, who There's could lots believe of, that? Lots and lots and lots of, of, of radical feminists absolutely do believe it. No, you don't hear about them. No, you don't, because their conferences are secret. I'm certainly not allowed into them, but there's plenty of them. There's plenty of them in the UN. Uh, it's actually quite comforting. I went to open the first help open the first refuge in the Arab world, in Bahrain. And it hadn't been feminized at all. And it was such a relief to be able to talk to a huge packed room of, big room of women and some men, to talk to them about issues they'd never been able to talk about publicly. Abortion, contraception, which wasn't allowed there. And there was no, there was no, nobody actually trying to make a war and one of the things I said to the refuge when they asked me to come out was, I'm very happy to come out, but I do want you to promise me that you will also listen to men, not just women. And they did. And that was, that was wonderful. Why do you think so few women are on board with the men's movement? First of all, I think most women aren't on board even with feminism. I mean, we have this kind of idea because we work in the circles we work, that everybody's like us, they're not. The average women on the streets, if you said to them, are you a feminist, they'd probably laugh. Um, the average people don't get involved with any of this. I think, well, certainly Voice for Men has women working with them. Uh, and they're very responsible towards their women. Um, and I think more women will actually, and are, are, are beginning to see that the, 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 the scales have, have tilted so disastrously that they actually do want to be involved. I know a lot of women, I get contacted by an awful lot of women who have sons who involve themselves with very violent partners and they, they can't see their grandchildren particularly as one of the great sorrows for, for any grandparent. Uh, but in a way, I think an awful lot of women are quite frightened of the idea of getting involved with men's MRAs because they assume MRAs are going to be against them, and that's not true. Actually, I have a much better relationship with MRAs than ever if I do try to talk to radical feminists because they hate me with a passion, whereas MRAs might completely disagree with me. But there isn't that fanatical hatred and actually, you have to remember that behind so many of those that began the women's movement, they were harmed by their fathers. They did have fathers who betrayed them. And they did make the personal, political. But that isn't the answer. But so do MRAs. Oh, yes, they do. I don't think it's the answer for either side. That's my argument with both sides. 
You are wasting your time. And this is, in many ways, I find it very self-indulgent. Everybody working themselves up into greats and having whatever, all of it, because the issue isn't that. The issue is it's generational. While you're busy playing gender wars for one reason or another, there are children being born who have no chance. Are you familiar with um, Dean Esme's, uh, he put together a document with the top MRA issues and initiatives that they want to put forth. And one of the issues was talking about male reproductive rights and yes. how they virtually have none, yes. except the right to have sex and wear a condom if you choose. Um, but they wanted to put forth a, a bill that would require fathers to sign a consent form upon the child being born and if they consented to fatherhood they could sign their name that they consent to the responsibility of taking care of that child or they can write off the responsibility and say I'm not responsible for this child I did not I do not choose to father this child they're relieved of any child support and they're out of the what? picture like so many of these intellectual ideas, completely, it's not going to work. When is he supposed to sign this? Upon the baby being born. What about before the baby's born? Well, I, I guess the idea is you No, will... I don't. If, if, um, I, I know Dean very well, we talk a lot. If he'd said that to me, I would have said, why don't you concentrate on making sure that we do get male contraception? I think it is extremely hard on men. And I've seen it happen quite a lot of times. And it's, it's very common for women to decide to have a child, choose a man, and then one way or another they will have the child. And he doesn't get a say in the matter. Yes, I mean, if, 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 if men had control over their own contraception, then it would be a great deal more equal. I think most women would agree. Give yeah. them contraceptives. Yeah, I, I don't want absolutely. it to be on me. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or both of you, you know. Mm -hmm. one, both be safe. Yeah. And uh, both be safe, yes, I'm absolutely for that. Um, I, just, I just think all this legislating about human relationships, you know, is a shocking waste of time because we humans aren't rational about our sexuality or about what we do in relationships. We really aren't. Mm -hmm. So let's be real. The one thing I would suggest is that we take uh, where there is domestic violence in, in relationships, we take those uh, cases out of the courts because the, the law is a very heavy instrument and human relationships are very fragile. They need to be taken out and dealt with by people who actually know what needs to be done. What we did in the refuge is we got, um, and it was un un never happened before, we got the Law Society to give us a waiver so the, the, the lawyers could come to our refuge and see the mothers and children together and get a personal relationship with them. And then mostly we would mediate, even with the very violent men, to a position where either side worked. It didn't always work. I mean, there were times when we just had to say, no, this is not gonna happen. He's too violent. But it would, and then we only used the courts to sign the final documents. See, I just think this whole, the drama into the relationship when it's, it's, it's very volatile anyway. Put it in a court situation where it's antagonistic. It's not, it's, it's only going to make it a great deal worse and very, very dangerous. Every time people would say, oh, now we fought hard and now we can, we can have these ousters and we can do this to the man, we can do that to the man. And I'd look at them and think, do you know what a very violent man, a piece of paper means nothing to him. The more you do this, the more danger she's in. Because if a man is extremely dull, or a woman, uh, and particularly if they're morbidly jealous, then the only safety she has is miles away from where he is. So he cannot track her down. I have a question for you. Um, when talking to the MRAs, they make it seem like a woman can simply lie in the court, say he abused you, say he raped you, molested your kids, and he's put away, and, and women have all the power in courts. They do in the whole, because you have to remember that the courts have been feminized for all the, all the, in, in the Western world, all the education on 
domestic violence has been done by the feminist movement, Women's Aid. In England, it's the Women's Aid Federation. They're all their packages. And all their packages are actually anti-men. Men are the perpetrators. So in a sense, there's been a great deal of brainwashing that's gone on. Mm -hmm. And yes, women can get away with, with murder, literally. And, uh, uh, and it's unjust and it's unfair. And that's why we need to actually take the, the, anti the antagonism between men and women because of all these situations, because this is a false situation. You take it back to generational violence and you treat it there. You treat it within the maternity house hospitals, you treat it in schools, you treat it very, very early on. And then we won't end up like this. But, but I, it's partly too, you know, majority of men don't want women to step off the pedestal. And, you know, there is this very part, big part of men that don't want to believe that women can be evil and violent and dangerous. I mean, the, the thing I find with the people that I work with is that a man will freely admit what his father does, but he finds it very hard to admit anything about his mother. I have a hard time thinking of women being violent and evil and conniving. Should have met my mother. <laughs> but then yeah. she's only a product of her background. I mean, that's why I don't see people as evil. I just see them as, as you know, the, there's a wonderful line, if I can get it right, I'll paraphrase. It's a, it's a poet called Auden. He's one of our English poets, one of the best poets ever. And he says it's virtually so something like, every schoolboy knows that evil that is done will do evil in return. And in a sense, that is right. That is what happens. What well, I'm interested in transcending. What is it about, say, four children in a family that makes it possible, perhaps, well, for the girl who came to visit me yesterday, she really transcended her extremely violent background. And she's made a huge success of her life. What is it about her as opposed to other brothers and sisters? We never look at that, we never even talk about it because we don't talk about generational violence. We just talk about women fighting men and men battering women. And we don't really talk very much at all about children, do we, in all this? We just ignore them. And yet, they are the victims. Who's teaching these, I mean, well you say it's learned behavior, being violent is learned behavior, sure. it's done to you. Um, Not even that, I mean, with, with the plasticity of the brain, of small children, because nobody really banked on that. For a long time they thought brain, a, a child was born all wired up, and they didn't realize that actually it's virtually, you have your genetic, you hold your genetic package, and what you, what you have in your hand thereafter, experience is the architect of the brain, and that's a very important concept. Everything that child has, it's like a sponge, so all the violence, the screaming, the anger, the, the, the alcohol and the abuse that goes on. I mean, the youngest, I think, of any child I saw or I knew about that was sexually abused was a little girl. She was three months old and her mother said, and he loves to kiss her pee-pee. I remember looking at her and saying, you know that's wrong. And in that case, all that family was not only violent, but it was also sexually abusive. And the mother was just as violent as the father in that case. And it was being able for her to come into the refuge, sometimes for six months at a time. That was the time we had when we could work with the children. And most of what we did, and all the funding that I ever had, was, went towards the children, because that was my greatest hope of change. Because it's what saved me as a child. Yeah, why, why did you turn out the way you are and not become violent from being abused? I was very violent as a child. I wrote a book called Infernal Child. I was very dangerous as well. And it was when I went, uh, my, my parents were sent back to China and they were, they were in a foreign office and they were under, they were captured by the communists. And Miss Williams was the woman who ran the children's home. And there was this woman, she was six foot seven, if you can imagine, she was a giant. <laughs> and she, I looked at her and I thought, I want to be like you. 
She actually, she drove ambulances in the war and she was a golf champ champion and she was also a magistrate and she was amazing. I was the only, she was the only person that could make me behave because I wanted her good opinion of me. And that's why I filled the refuge full of, of uh, mentors, particularly men. And even now, so many of the children, they recite the names of the men that they know and knew from the refuge. You had more men mentors than women mentors? No, it was about equal. Oh, equal, equal. Point, okay. yeah. Yeah, that just wouldn't fly today, huh? There was no men are allowed in refuges. We do have the stigma that men could potentially be pedophiles. Racist. Except if you do the work I do, I've had dealt with as many women pedophiles. It's just that they're not suspected like men. So hard to wrap my brain around this. Cause no, because if you just think, you have to just change the way you think. If a little girl is sexually abused, chances are she will move on and sexually abuse. Pedophiles tend to actually act out the times when they were molested as children. Virtually all pedophiles have been sexually abused as children. And I did a lot of work, particularly in Santa Fe, because that was very lawless when I was down there in the 80s. And there were only two DAs, and there were a lot of pedophiles came down there because they could get away with it. I remember talking to one pedophile, and he said, well, I don't really care what you do because I'm going to move up to Alaska. And that's what he'd do, because he, he was in the government, he'd just move his whole operation up there. Yeah. There is nothing that men can do that women don't do. There isn't, actually, even rape. How does that work? Well, erections are a physiological reaction to stimulation. So a woman can stimulate a man and rape him, just as, even if against his will. It can happen. It does happen. But actually, one of the problems with the whole rape issue is that now it's become a really... There's a kind of myth that we all live in this, this, this rape society. We don't. The actual rape, which happens between, between people, happens, and it certainly happens, but it's now been watered down to where it's become rather like the definition for domestic violence. The definition for domestic violence is so wide now that raising your voice, shouting at your partner is domestic violence. And I've always said, most couples should be in jail because throwing things, I've thrown a cup of coffee in my time. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. And the thing with rape, there should, I think, and you get screamed at for saying this, there is rape where somebody, a man, if you like, with evil intent, violates a woman and harms her. Well, just even by raping her, he's harming her. But then when we get to people who know each other, a man and a woman who are in bed together, and she suddenly announces that he's guilty of raping her. This, this is a whole different argument. And the, the two things don't weigh equally. And I think we need to separate it, because at the moment it's a mess. And it's getting everybody nowhere. It's very confusing what the def definition of rape or sexual assault is. Well, really you can't define it, because it, it's, again, it's this thing of he says, she says. But if, if, in a sense, again, it's no evidence, isn't it, if she, she says, I mean, there was a case which, in fact, the voice for men were involved with, I, 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 he was on my show a couple, last week, and he finally, after a appalling childhood, made it to Harvard, and this is public, so I'm not talking out of turn, he made it to Harvard and he dated a girl and he took her out and he was kissing her. And they went back, um, and he went back to his place, and she went back to hers. The next thing you know, she's claimed rape. There's no evidence, there's no semen, there's nothing. He just says, she just said, that he was kissing her, and then he got his, he, he, he masturbated. And that's, he, he was then thrown out of Harvard. This is what this argument's about. He's trying to get a trial by jury, because he believes, and I believe with him, that if there was a trial by jury, he'd be found not guilty, but he's ruined. But they were kissing, and then he masturbated in front she of her? She didn't even say that. All I know is that the evidence is that he said she, he ejaculated. He masturbated. 
whether he was moving against her when he was kissing her or whatever, I don't know the details. Mm. But that's what the, what the, the, is, is now, yesterday I think it was, there was a demonstration in Idaho in the courts mm. uh, to tree, trying to get a trial by jury. I do think that at a very simple level, it should be equal. So when there is an allegation of rape, the, the so-called rapist has a right to legal representation, just as the victim has. Well, so there's a new saying in the young feminist community online, saying consent, having sex with consent means saying a resounding yes, an enthusiastic yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Look, well, no, because, because actually that's what you hope sexual intercourse between men and women is, isn't it? A resounding yes, let's do this. But people don't. I, mean, I know, of course they don't. And, and, and so often, the, the last case that I was interested in, the woman who came to see me and she explained, she'd been at a party, this married man was making, tracing her around. He kissed her outside. She went outside, he came outside. He tried to kiss her, she pushed him off. She came inside. She went upstairs to the bathroom. She said he came up and knocked on the door. She told him to go away. Then she decides, rather than go home because her car's outside the house, that she'll stay the night. So she decides to stay the night. She's given a sleeping bag and she goes into the study in the house. And then halfway through the night, he comes in and sits down beside the sleeping bag. And he then says, she raped him. He raped her. For two years, she said nothing. And all of a sudden, She's now decided to do him for rape. So she goes to the police, and the police ring him up. He's with his family in Hong Kong. He's, he's always had an extremely good job. He's with it and, and he says to the police, well, yes, it did happen. It was consensual. You know, she was in the sleeping bag. I came in. She opened the sleeping bag, which I know she did, because she said she did. Right, well, where do you go from there? If it's he said, she said, then her feelings, her emotions, I, don't, I mean, it's not like we have a camera recording no. or an audio device to hear if she said yes or not. But my, my, her actions seem... my concern for her was that she'd get torn apart in a court. She would. And my feeling was to say to her, well, understand this, uh, because she had other very serious issues. To be honest with you, what I thought, she wasn't a patient of mine, but she'd asked me for my opinion. My thought at the end of it is what happened is that she did have sex with him, and then she found that that was all he wanted, and thereafter he virtually ignored her. And that was enough to make her feel terrible. But I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, I think it would be... One of the things I did find is that if things left in the unconscious, which they are most for most of the things that we, our brains can't bear to look at or our feelings, it can drive you to do things that even you are amazed by or ashamed by. And a bit of alcohol can make it even more dangerous for you. And I know there was a lot of times when you're talking, it's very, because it, you know, Freud was the first person to ever even explain the unconscious. Nobody even knew it existed before. But the thing he didn't do was to map the unconscious, because he didn't know how to. And I always thought, if you take a woman by the hand, and you begin at the beginning of the first of her ever memories, and you two walk through what happened during all that time, so she can resolve, and suddenly other things come up. And I used to say, it's like unpacking an attic that's been full of, of packing cases that you've never looked at. And that's the work I used to do with the mothers because they were with me long enough to be able to do it. It isn't, well, we'll take you in for one month, then you have to find somewhere to live or we'll find. It was like women could stay in the crisis refuge as long as they wanted to. Some stayed for years. Some moved on and became mothers who actually ran the refuge. Others moved on to the second stages and they were there for three or four years. Others moved off by themselves quite happily. But there were chances there for people to really find out who they are. 
And one of the problems for counselling, it's not properly taught, because again, the, 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 what people, what counsellors are taught, uh, essentially is males are perpetrators and females are innocent victims. And it's not like that. Human nature is infinitely complicated. Do you think every victim has to take some responsibility for what happened? We all make choices. We take responsibility for our choices. And until you actually wake up to why you do it, and it took me a very long time to realize some of the choices I made. And then I realized far too late, my father was such a brilliant man for all the terrifying monster he was in many ways. I really, really enjoyed listening to him because he was an old China hand. He was an Arabist, I mean, he was all sorts of things. And I looked for that sort of man without even realizing it, and which is fairly disastrous. Um, and I think for all of us, yeah. What do they say? An unexamined life is not worth living. So I think we all have to. And most of all, we need to be trained from a very young age about how we make relationships and why we make relationships. Not just about sex, but they don't teach relationships in schools. We met with a domestic violence victim this morning in San Diego mm -hmm. and interviewed him for a few hours. And I found his first few months of beginning to date this girl very questionable in his choices. Mm -hmm. And as much as I wanted to feel sorry for him and say, yes, you are a male victim of domestic violence, um, I, found, I found myself victim blaming, um, which is part of rape culture, if you've heard. Uh, what, what, yeah, because I've always yeah. been told that I'm victim blaming. No, mm. he, in many cases, again, it goes back to that thing. There are people who are innocent victims of their partner's violence. They quite genuinely really fall in for headlines for, for somebody and then find, my God, he's a raving psychopath. And you can't pick those out. I don't care how practiced you are. Mm. But the majority are the women that I've said who are victims of their own violence and their choices are based from their own childhood damage. Now you'll find an awful lot of men going for narcissistic women. She, because the man himself has very bad image of himself, he's had probably an extremely damaging relationship with his mother. And what does he do? He goes out and the girl who's in the center of the room getting all the attention, everybody wants to be with her, that's the one he'll pick. Why did, he never asked himself why he does that? And it's disastrous. He is responsible for his decision, of course he is. And I don't let people off the hook any more than I let me off the hook. You know, we, we are. The choices we make bring consequences into our lives. And the tragedy is when people don't even think that they actually get involved with a dangerous, violent person. And I look at them and say, and you chose to have children with him? What have you done to your children? You've landed them in this situation. And they look at you because they've never even thought that they have a responsibility of choosing a parent who is not going to be dangerous to the child. See, I come from a time for all the things that wasn't right. Families knew each other. And I remember the first man I was really attracted to, Miss Williams was sitting, because we used to be chaperoned in my day, you didn't go out on dates or any of that sort of thing until you were about 102. But I remember her sitting there and I was dancing with this very divine young man. She called me over and she said, you're never dancing with him again, Erin. And I said, well, why not? And she said, bad blood, because she knew the family. And actually, she turned out to be right. Hmm. Well, families did know each other, you know, and people, and, and in a sense, you know, it wasn't the Asian idea of an arranged marriage, but to an extent it was arranged. Because, and, and actually, at my, in my time, if it was a professional man marrying a woman, she had to come and meet the people that he was working for. To, yeah, it was, it was far more regulated than it is now. Because the fact, and the truth is, you don't just get involved with a man. He gets them, you get him involved, and you get involved with his family, and he gets involved with your family. And then what can happen to so many families? 
is that if he turns out to be extremely violent and dangerous, you decimate your family. How many mothers, you know, fathers are beside themselves knowing that their children are being harmed and their grandchildren? Nobody even considers them. They don't have any rights. Yeah, I, d I do find myself um, questioning the choices of some of these victims. Well, um, they're not victims. You have to tell them. Well, you can't tell them that. I'd tell them that. I'd simply <laughs> say, stop it. No. It's your choice and your consequence. And I'm, 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 I'm certainly will sympathize, but I won't let them tell me that they're victims because they're not. Mm. Any more than I would with the women. Because they would come in seeing themselves as victims. You know, he did this, he did that, he did that. And then uh, I'd just say to them, and you? What, what, what was your part? Because you see, what I knew from the beginning, like most domestic violence is consensual. Both are involved. Sometimes one's the perpetrator, the other plays the victim, then it crosses over. It's not, it's not as though it's just all men or all women. It's both. And occasionally innocent victims, very innocent. But they're the ones that are going to be all right because they're still, they, they, they're, they're whole. Most of them have come from good, warm, loving families and they can move on. The people who get so incredibly damaged and don't see themselves as anything other than victims are those that have been there from their whole lives. That's why it was important when I did questionnaires to look at three generations because you could see where it was coming from. Mm. Have you heard of the movie Monster? with Charlize Theron. Uh, it was based off a true story, but uh, it was a serial killer who uh, was a prostitute and she a woman. was a woman. Mm. And she was uh, abused and raped and held at gunpoint and you know put through everything uh, in her line of work. And she ended up turning on her clients uh, and going on a killing spree. And when I watched the film, uh, I found myself feeling like she's a victim of her circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see her as this murderer. Um, I saw her as a victim of her cir circumstances. And I wish I looked at more men that way because these violent men probably were abused. Yeah. Um, I see them both that way. Actually, I'm, I don't condone uh, her for murdering men. I don't think, but I, I, can, I, can, I can absolutely understand. I mean, I've always tried to explain that, especially my childhood, I tried to kill my father quite seriously. And it's like, once you get to that point as a child, I was a teenager, it's like being a piece of, plus, uh, of um, elastic that's been pulled. You know, when you pull it really, really tight, and then when you let it go, it, it's, all, it's all bendy, it's no longer. That's exactly what happens. That you get pushed to where it, it, it essentially, you never, you, in a sense also, my mother set it up. And I realised that. It, much later I realised that. Her message to me was, you know, he is so dreadful and he's going to ask me for sex and it's your job to stop him because he'd been abroad and he's just come home. And I, I, that's why it's so incredibly complicated. And yes, in that particular film, you feel a huge amount of compassion for her. But if you knew, we had a, a very famous case, it was called Niels. Um, he strangled and chopped up and ate an awful lot of young homosexuals. And he's obviously in prison for the rest of his life. But if you knew the background, of his in totally incestuous mother. He was in her bed, I found out from the psychiatrist. Till he was 15 and a half, and then she took a lover. And she wanted to share the bed with him and with the lover. And that precipitated a massive breakdown. And that's why he eventually went for destroying all these young men. And it's never come out, the truth of why he did it. They know how he did it, but they don't know why. It's a cycle. Yeah. It, as they talk about the cycle of poverty, cycle of deprivation, there is the cycle of violence, and all of it tends to go together. Not 
that this kind of very, very significant violence can happen right the way across, across ev everywhere. I mean, it can be certainly in the royal family, it can be Princess Di, because her father was extremely violent. And yeah, it, it, it knows no boundaries. So, what I'm gathering, and correct me if I'm wrong, most abusers and violent people have some kind of history in their past, their childhood? Virtually all. Virtually all. Mm -hmm. But not all people who were abused as children become Absolutely. murderers or rapists. No, and, and, and because for so many, there are other factors. For instance, I, I've often thought in the, in the upper middle class families, they have nannies, often who are surrogate mothers, however bad the mother is. They have an option, boarding school, I went to boarding school from the age of nine to 16, saved me because I didn't have to live with them. You see, that's another out that, that wealthy people have. The children can get away, make, look at other models, see other things happening. And uh, uh, th th there are other ways of, of people transcending the violence. No, the problem is that too many repeat the pattern.